Good morning, everyone, and I would like to welcome you to the October meeting of the Tobacco Settlement Agreement Fund Oversight Committee, and we will begin, we're going to start, uh, I'll ask Senator Whitney Westerfield if he could lead us in a prayer and the pledge, please. That would be pleased. Father, first we give you praise and glory. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to serve uh, in the roles that we're in. I pray, Father, that you us in this room and all those in this building, uh, all of the staff, all of the people that make the legislative uh, process work, we pray that you give us wisdom and strength. Watch over all of us as we, as we part our uh, different ways today and as we come and go from this place back to our districts, keep us safe on the road. Pray, Father, for those um, who are ill and infirm, we pray for those uh, who uh, are still struggling as they recover from the floods uh, in the east. And in fact, Father, we, we pray still for those recovering from the tornadoes in the west. And Father, we give a special uh, request. Father, we pray that you are with Wanda. In all things, Father, we trust, Lord, that your will is done, not ours. We pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll stand and let you lead us in the pledge. Yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic, the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As Senator Westerfield we lost we we lost our our co-committee chair here on our committee and could not have had a finer person to serve both with both here in the house and in the senate i know when i first got to frankfurt our co-chair was serving there within the house and later went to the senate and we have a citation I'll ask our clerk to read, and we want to remember CB and Wanda both. I ask you to please read. Oh, one moment. Yes. Before we read that, we will go ahead. I'll ask the secretary to call the roll, please. Senator Rocky Adams. Senator Parrott. Senator Webb, Senator Westerfield, Here. Representative Brown, Representative King, present. Representative Pratt, present. Representative Reed, Here. Representative Roberts, Here. Co-Chair Hornback, and Co-Chair Dossett. Present. Now, we'll ask the clerk to read our citation. To all to whom these presents shall come, greetings. Know ye that... State Senator Carlos C.B. Embry, Jr. is mourned on this day and recognized by the members of this honorable body as a distinguished citizen and state leader who made many lasting contributions to his family, community, and commonwealth before his passing on September 29, 2022. The son of the late Carlos B. Sr. and Zora Romans Embry, he was also preceded in death by his granddaughter Heather Denise West and his half-sister Jane Carol Hardwick. He is survived by his cherished wife of 60 years, Wanda Lou Ralph Embry, beloved children, Laura Ann West, Barbie, Barbie Embry, and Carlos B. Embry III, grandchildren, Meredith Embry, Carlos B. Embry IV, Roy Dale West Jr., and April Nicole Laughlin, and great-grandchildren, Carlos B. Embry V and Aza Wayne Embry and a host of other family members, friends, and loved ones. A resident of Morgantown, Kentucky, and a graduate of Western Kentucky University who also studied at the Kentucky Institute for Economic Development, Duke University, and Kentucky Wesleyan College, Senator Embry served as general manager for Embry Newspapers Incorporated and as a teacher at Pleasant Ridge Elementary School and Horse Branch Junior High School before entering public service when he became the youngest elected mayor of Beaver Dam in 1970. In 2002, he, became his, he began his tenure as a member of the Kentucky House of Representatives, 
representing the interests of House District 17 from 20 from 2002 until 2014 when he was elected to the Kentucky Senate where he served honorably on behalf of Senate District 6 until his passing. In addition to his service as co-chair of the Tobacco Settlement Agreement Fund Oversight Committee, he successfully sponsored legislation that was signed into law by five different governors, served dutifully as a member of the Committees on Agriculture, Natural Resources and Energy and Transportation, as well as the State Police Safety Measures Task Force, and was chair of both the Veterans, Militaries, and Public Protection Committee and the Budget Review Subcommittee on Education. Senator C.B. Embry, Jr., a public servant of the highest caliber and a man of tremendous warmth, integrity, and vision, will be remembered by all those lives who were touched by his, pre by his presence. On the motion of Representative Myron B. Dossett and the members of Tobacco Settlement Agreement Fund Oversight Committee, it is hereby deemed by this honorable body most worthy of its remembrance. Excuse me. Uh, now we'll move on to our minutes. Can I have a motion on our minutes? Second. Those in favor? Any opposed? Motion on the minutes is passed. Uh, next, we'll have our first presentation. We're going to have Bill McCloskey, who's the Deputy Executive Director of the Kentucky Office of Ag Policy. Bill, I ask you to come to the desk and please proceed. Good morning, Bill McCloskey, Deputy Executive Director. I am going solo this morning. Our Director Lacefield is down speaking in Caldwell County this morning. I believe it KDES is the county seat there, Representative Dossett. So, and I've had the the good the good fortune now of over 21 years being part of this initiative that you all have uh, established and supported over 700 million dollars. Represent our Senator Parrott in uh, growing agriculture from what was a four billion dollar industry as we've given you updates in the past to uh, over seven billion dollars in uh, cash receipts so we're going to start with giving you the update on the kentucky agriculture finance corporation board meeting that met recently so you can see the update where we approved 10 loans for $1,796,200 and you can see total project cost almost eight million dollars and of these 10 loans we've also listed out the lenders that we work with across the state in providing these below market interest loans at 2.75 percent and as i was reviewing this morning i know we were going to have an update from farm service agency here that we have of the 10 loans one two three four five six of them or 60 percent have FSA guarantees so it indicates how uh, state government working with your lenders across the state and also working with USDA to provide the uh, access to capital to our farmers uh, across the state and there's also two of those loans uh, Representative Roberts had direct loans so it's a way to share the risk or mitigate the risk at the same time providing again below market interest rates representative read to our farmers across the state in many of these cases the lender based on their underwriting underwriting standards would not be able to provide all the finance or finance the project in some cases up to 100 percent so with the kentucky ag finance corporation we're able to make that funds available as well as bring in fsa on a direct loan and loan guarantees and we're currently a ag finance corporation it is a hundred and three million dollar lending authority that we have in in the state we've got uh, 700 loans on the books and we're generating over a million dollars a month revolving back in that we can now uh, loan out no questions i'll move on to the ag development board action you can see on page two is update on the programs are approved we've got the 
the Cape County Agriculture Investment Program, Deceased Farm Mantle Removal, Next Generation Farm, uh, Shared Use Equipment. We did have one applicant. That was Monroe County. They were approved for $66,375, and that was for the purchase of three no-till drills. So Monroe County does a good job, over 10 pieces of equipment that they rent out to the farmers in Monroe County. Again, three no-till drills total purchase price was eighty eight thousand five hundred dollars so they were able to uh, use county money 75 percent of the purchase price and then we've got the youth program so total approval in county programs one million four hundred ninety two thousand two hundred eighty six dollars moving on we're on page uh, three representative pratt you see an update or an amendment to oldham county Request an additional $12,615 to bring total to $42,615 to support the, the CAPE program in Oldham County. Uh, getting into projects, we're on uh, page 4, C Sierra Enterprises in Pendleton County requested $60,000 in state and county funds to build a community education and com commercial kitchen. Uh, the previously had been renting the buildings. So the applicant wanted to bring the operation back on the farm. When the Ag Development Board looks at a project like this, they look at how what how big the impact is to other farmers. Uh, based on the application, it was it was limited. Uh, so that this with this application, the Ag Development Board supported the county money, which was six six thousand dollars. The applicants would be eligible to pursue a loan through the Kentucky Agriculture Finance Corporation. Next is on page five, the Greenup County Extension District Board was approved for $250,000 to establish a farmer's market in uh, Greenup County. So this is a priority the Ag Development Board will, they will make state money available to support farmer's markets across the state. O over uh, 50 farmer's markets have been funded with these Ag uh, Development Funds. This is a $500,000 project there. It will be located next to the extension, which is convenient for extension agents that can help the vendors uh, develop the, the farmer's market and also provide technical assistance. Uh, next, we're on page uh, six, Beach, Beachwood Independent Schools was approved for up to $76,500 in county money. So greenhouse projects are limited. The, the, the model has been, uh, uh, the investment model from the Ag Development Board has been uh, supported with county money. And so they are eligible to pursue county money to support this greenhouse project. Page seven, uh, GAV meat uh, processing. So this was approved for uh, count state money and county money. Another priority of the Ag Development Board will make sta state money available to support meat processing. We've documented in the last uh, couple of years. So this makes over 40 meat processors that receive financial incentives uh, of the 80 that we've identified that provide custom and USDA uh, services. Uh, next on page eight, we've got an application from Owensboro. It's Grain Day Inc. So this is a long-standing ag uh, project that's a, uh, held every year in Owensboro. So they've committed five thousand dollars in county money to support the uh, project. And then you've got the press releases as at the end there. Um, Representative Dawson, any questions? And, uh, Thank you, Bill. Do we have any questions from the committee members? Bill, we want to thank you for the presentation. Yep. Look forward to hearing from you next month. Next, we'll have coming before us Dean Schmore, who is the uh, State Executive Director with the FSA, and also Angela Watson, who's the Farm Program Chief as well with the FSA. I uh, ask you to come to the desk, please.
before you begin, Dean, I'll share with the committee members. Uh, over the last week or so, there within Christian County in West Kentucky, we're receiving quite a few phone calls uh, concerning drought conditions that we're experiencing. Uh, issues there. I know of individuals that have sowed pastures uh, here over the last month or so, and with the lack of rain, I think we've been over 30 days without any rain there and uh, mm. that crop's not com is not coming up it looks like our pastures we've lost our pastures and then going back earlier in the summer with the extensive heat it damaged our corn crop and it was damaging pastures uh, there as well and uh, having a conversation with director lacefield and commissioner quarles uh, we they informed me that it would be very informational for all of us to have uh, Dean come in and speak to us to get uh, have information there from the USDA of possible things that our farmers might be able to reach out to for assistance. So I want to thank you both for being here. And, Dean, welcome you back. We greatly appreciate you, and we do miss you in the house, but we know you're doing a wonderful job where you're at. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I'm Dean Shamor with FSA. And just briefly, if I might just share a story about C.B. Embry. You know, I enjoyed uh, being a colleague of his, and I knew him before I ran for office. In fact, he consulted with me some before I ran. And while I was here, he was always a gentleman to me, and, and uh, I know he was a gentleman with all the members he served with. So, again, uh, like you all, I uh, will miss seeing C.B. and his wife, was normally a tag along. So, you know, we have several members like that where uh, we get the, you know, spouses come a lot too, like uh, Representative King. We see Carrie at a lot of events. So uh, we'll miss them, seeing them both. I know you all will as well. I'll let Angela introduce herself. Thank you. Um, my name is Angela Watson, and I, I do work for the Farm Service Agency. Um, I am not, in fact, the Farm Program's chief, but I am a Farm Program Specialist um, at our state office. I've been there for about three years, but I've been with the agency for almost 20 and spent the majority of those years working in our county office, uh, a couple of different county offices. And um, I, I love getting to serve the farmers, and thank you all for having me here today. So I'll let uh, Angela go over it and explain how the drought conditions are set and what has to be met to trigger those conditions. And uh, then if you all have any questions, be glad to field those as well. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, <clears throat> so FSA does have several disaster programs that can assist producers who are facing a drought. Um, in your folders today, you have a copy of this brochure, which is just um, disaster programs at a glance. And these are the programs that both FSA, NRCS, and RMA, which is risk management, um, have available that for all kinds of disaster assistance. So you can kind of see as you look across there, it shows the different um, eligible loss conditions that apply to each program and when those programs may kick into place. These are all programs that were, uh, are permanent programs that are part of the 2014 Farm Bill. Some of the programs have been around from previous Farm Bills as well, and they, they're, they're so useful that we're continuing to have those programs from Farm Bill to Farm Bill, sometimes with a few modifications, and sometimes it's just the same program in place. Um, so as you look down through there, you can see the ones that, uh, where drought is considered an eligible loss condition for all of those programs. And before I talk about a few of those specific programs, I wanted to kind of take a look at how the Farm Bill defines drought with regards to these programs that we have. So drought is defined in a 7 CFR section 1416.102. And it is any area of the county that is rated by the US Drought Monitor as having a D2 severe drought intensity for at least eight consecutive weeks for the specific type of eligible grazing land or pasture land, or a D3 extreme drought or D4 exceptional drought intensity for the specific type of eligible grazing land for the county as determined by the secretary. For Kentucky, most of the types of grasses that we have as pasture land across the state, that grazing period, that normal grazing period is March the 31st through November the 15th. So as that uh, brochure demonstrates, drought is an eligible loss condition, and it is determined solely from information collected and disseminated through the U.S. Drought Monitor. 
your packet contains a, a printout of last week's drought monitor because this week's hadn't appeared yet when I left the office, but on your screen is the most recent. So you can see the changes that have occurred over the last week. Um, using the drought monitor, like I said, is, is mandated by the Farm Bill, and this keeps it from being um, a, a decision that has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. It makes it consistent across the whole country. Everyone is using the data on the drought monitor. And once those conditions, any of those conditions are met, the programs kick into place and producers can, be, can begin enrollment. Our offices use a variety of methods to um, reach out to the producers and let them know when these, when these conditions have kicked in. They monitor this uh, drought monitor weekly, um, especially when they know that, that there has, have been rainfall <clears throat> shortages. And of course, we know that rainfall shortages affect our, our crops and our pasture um, before it necessarily, uh, these before these programs would kick in based on the drought monitor, but this is what we're required to use for those programs. Um, some of the ways our offices connect with producers, we have a monthly newsletter, we have text alerts. Producers are encouraged to sign up for those methods of communication. They also do outreach meetings, phone calls, and that sort of stuff when we know that these programs are gonna kick in because we want our producers to be able to uh, participate and take advantage when they've been severely affected by the, by the conditions. So. A quick look at a few of the programs that we do have. The primary program that we administer when drought occurs is the Livestock Forage Program, LFP. And LFP compensates eligible livestock producers for grazing losses incurred because of the drought conditions on eligible pasture land dur during the normal grazing season. Um, and I, I believe you guys have a copy of the email from Jennifer Farmer in your packets as well. Uh, she is our firm programs chief and that gives some more details about what I'm saying here today as well. Um, so when our counties meet these conditions and LFP kicks in, the producers sign up and they're eligible for a payment. That payment rate depends on which drought level has kicked in and how long that drought has continued. Uh, producers who suffer losses, uh, livestock producers who suffer losses may also be eligible for reimbursement if they had to assume additional transportation costs for water because of the drought. And that program is the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm-Raised Fish Program, or ELAP for short. And the third program that, that primarily uh, kicks in when there are drought conditions is NAP, which is our Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program. And this program is for producers of non-traditional crops who have purchased crop insurance for those. So Risk Management Association uh, underwrites crop insurance for traditional uh, covered commodities, and in Kentucky, those are generally corn, soybeans, wheat for grain, and tobacco. Um, any other crop that is grown, because RMA doesn't, off, doesn't underwrite traditional crop insurance policies for those, you can purchase that poli policy through FSA <coughs> under our NAP program. And if you suffer losses to your yield and you have that coverage, then payment can be made just like it would through regular traditional crop insurance. Um, so that, that assists with mitigating. Um, like I mentioned, most Kentucky counties, corn, soybeans, wheat, and tobacco are covered commodities for RMA's crop insurance policies. I can't speak to the details of those policies because I don't work for RMA, but in a broad sense, if you have purchased coverage and you suffer a loss, drought is an eligible loss condition under those programs and producers would need to contact their loss adjuster to find out what can be done to mitigate those losses under those programs. Um, I hope that this brief overview has given you some tools in your packet. You have fact sheets which give more information about the three programs that I spoke about, LFP, ELAP, and NAP. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. And do we have questions from Senator Hornback? Just a question. Thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, you know, when I look at that drought monitor, a lot of this you're not eligible, especially on the uh, uh, LFP program. Yes, you're sir. not eligible unless it's a D2, is that correct? Correct, D2 for eight weeks. And so the only part of the state that we got that's covered in that is the far western part of the state, is that right? Correct. And I know whether it being Shelby County, it's in the D0. Mm -hmm. 
uh, or a lot of other counties around there, I mean, the effect is already there and it's a lot worse. And, yeah. and I don't see us in watching this over the past years, I don't see us ever getting into a D2. So we'll never be eligible, even though the losses are there, because I know everybody in Shelby County in a D0, normally you wouldn't start feeding hay and stuff, uh, supplementing the, the food source for the livestock until in the November, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're doing that already. So just something to pass mm -hmm. up the chain that yeah. uh, the, the way that is done maybe isn't sufficient enough to cover some of the hardships that farmers have. Yeah, we did have two counties right now. They're showing a D2, but two of our far western Kentucky counties that are currently a D2 were a D3 in set a few weeks prior. And so at the D3 level, that LFP program kicks in as soon as you hit a D3. It doesn't require an extended uh, time in D3 mm -hmm. or D4. And so they have been able to take advantage of LFP for, for a small payment. And under D3 and D4, if that condition lasts for four weeks, an additional payment kicks in. Um, but as, as of today, only two counties have, have been able to use LFP at all. So, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Senator Hornback. Go. <laughs> I've always got lots of questions. <laughs> and this is for Dean, and this is not related to the uh, disaster or anything else. But just a question. Uh, I noticed where the uh, state committee uh, has decided or, or moved forward with separating Woodford and Fayette County. Uh, I know that I sit on the committee uh, for eight years and uh, is a tough decision to combine counties. Mm -hmm. But in Woodford and Fayette that had shared management, uh, you decided to, uh, or not you, the committee decided uh, to separate those counties, uh, hire an additional CED, keep staffing pretty much the same. The way I understand it, Fayette has two PTs and Woodford has one PT. And Dean, as you know, and you've been to Shelby County and you know what my complaint is. Mm -hmm. We've got counties around the state that have multiple counties that are much larger farming counties than Woodford and Fayette. Mm -hmm. And could you explain to me the justification in separating those counties, keeping them staffed the way they are, mm -hmm. and then having other counties that are uh, have a lot more ag production than what mm -hmm. those do, and them still being terribly short staffed? I mean, I don't understand that. That doesn't seem right. So I don't have those counties in front of me, but uh, Woodford does and Fayette does both more than one county. I know like Scott County is in one of those as well. Do you, do you, have, do you happen to know those? Uh, Fayette covers Scott and Nicholas, I believe. And then what does Woodford cover? Just Woodford. Woodford, okay. No, so Frank, Franklin. Franklin County. Franklin. Okay, yeah. So, so they, they do multiple. So we have a dashboard that shows the, the amount of work that goes on in those offices and how many people that – that those those also can justify. Of course, the problem is that number may be 240, but we're ceiling at 208. If you add all those up, it may be 240 people. But we're ceiling at 208, so we're we're not ceiling as far as, as you would think that the way it would be is budget wise. So if we had a CD making more money than a PT, why don't you get two PTs and get rid of a CD? But that's not that's not how they do it. They do it by by people. Uh, instead of how much a person cost us. So I, I think the uh, currently uh, Fayette may have one CD and one PT, but, you know, if a PT goes, I don't know if they'll get another PT. You know, I, I think they're, you know, I think some of their comments that I heard in the meeting is like these offices that had two PTs, maybe just go into a CD and a PT, not CD and necessarily two PTs. So that's a decision that, that's made every time. So when they lose a PT, that state committee may not decide to refill that PT in in, uh, in Fayette County, so that that's a that's a possibility there. But it, I wish we had a dozen more people. And I know Shelbyville did get a new PT. I think started back in August. So I hope they're getting trained up so they have a CD and two PTs there now. Hopefully they're getting that want to be trained up to offer good service. And I know Shelbyville does cover a lot of counties, including Jefferson County, which you know there's a big push for urban ag. So if urban ag was to take off, they would be and and taking care of those counties. Uh, I mean that county and all those programs as well. And the urban ag may take 
they may have just as much time spending with the person that does container than they do you with your farming operation. So once some of that data gets mixed in, you know, it would justify more people there. So they're constantly look at that. It's a juggling act to, to fill those uh, positions. And uh, like I said, if we had, if they gave us a, they, this year they cut me two county staff, which that's county positions that you're talking about. And they increased me to federal staff. Uh, but they did also, they allowed us to hire, they allowed us to put people in what's called, used to be called our COT program, to train them for those CD positions, not CDT. They gave us, uh, where when they're in training, they don't count against our cap. So that kind of helps us a little bit with the, with putting people in these offices. But but you're right, and it is a concern, and, and, I, and that, that is not my call. That is the state committee's call, and they, uh, you know, they do look at that, and of course, that's like everything else. It's it's lobbying who lobbies them for, for those positions. That's not only district directors, but that's people they know in the community. I mean, we have a uh, board member from Woodford County, so I'm oh, sure yeah. he had some influence in that, just like you would if it was your county. And so you know that's uh, there's politics and everything. But uh, you know, uh, I urge you to keep in in touch with those state committee members and just let them know and invite them over to look. And I think that's that's huge. And and the district directors when they get in front of the state committee and you know they get to lobby for those positions as well and but it's not it's not like we've got 20 people and we're we're trying to find a spot to put them it's 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 really it is really a tough decision as you know where to where to put those people well i appreciate your job you're doing dean because i know you were in shelby county i think last week and i appreciate your job you're doing thank you thank you dean i'm going to return back to the issue here with mm -hmm. the with, with with the drought that we're experiencing right mm -hmm. there uh, did we release the crp program uh, uh ground to be able to have access for uh individuals either to cut that as hay or uh, put cattle on yes I'm bel i believe in some of the counties we did um as the, as requested I'm, i can't can't say which counties that we did that in but i know that is an option it that CRP can be released for um, hanging and grazing during drought conditions. Have we have we passed the deadline for that, or is it still available? I'm not sure. Uh, we can you can we email can, them that. We can certainly Please. find that. Mm -hmm. because these are questions, as I said, sure. that I'm being asked at home. Uh, uh, when we're looking here at uh, the. Uh, as we, when you look at the map, and I know uh, I was looking at what was what would have been the end of September, the first week of October, the the biggest part of the state was in a D zero, and now I look across the south. Uh, the southern part of the state that has gone to a D1. And uh, as I said, our phones were starting, mm -hmm. people are starting to reach out to us and ask these questions. Uh, should, as we move forward, if we see the lack of rain continue right here, uh, Dean, should we as a committee or should we reach out uh, from whether from this committee, the Agriculture Committee, to either the Ag Commissioner or the Governor to submit a request to uh, to the Secretary of Agriculture to have a closer look uh, if we see these conditions uh, worsen. I don't think that could change anything because it is written in the Farm Bill. Now, what could change is the Farm Bill. So you know, if, right. If, uh, you all were to reach out to you know senator mcconnell's office be a great office he's very involved in the farm bill and uh see if you can get a conversation around that as well as uh you know the, the other members of congress in the state who are who are active with the farm bill and to see if you could talk to them about the drought to see if it's something that can change of course they can't just change it for yeah. kentucky it's changed all over and chairman and senator hornbach both y'all made points that are that we understand in fact it's like right now you look at this map, how much it changed in a week, you kind of hope it doesn't rain. Because if it doesn't rain, we get more of this disaster. You know, it's like the damage has already been done. It's like the, a lot of this damage has already been done. So, you, you know, and, and then you get a rain and then it resets everything. And uh, when the, it resets the monitor that the programs are paid off of, right. when the damage has really, has really already been done. 
So I, I don't, you know, Angie, you've been doing this longer than, than I have for sure. I don't know if a letter would, if there's, there's really nothing set in place for a letter to trigger, I guess, right? No, unfortunately, most of the time when we get what the ad hoc programs that are outside of the farm bill, it's for a large nationwide issue, like several of the programs that came out to mitigate the, the uh, coronavirus effects, you know, the, 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 all of the different things that happened with being able to market crops and things like that. We had some ad hoc programs that kicked into place for that. Um, but as far as just for us, I'm not currently aware of, of anything we could trigger right now outside of this. But as, as Dean mentioned, um, it is farm bill time. So I also know that uh, we did have CRP mm -hmm. uh, ground that was released that was in Graves and Galloway County. Those were the two uh, counties that hit the D3. Yes, those were the, Correct. and uh, of course, as I said, whenever county I, where I, I represent uh, is very large agricultural county and uh, when when you go through and see mm -hmm. the change in the pastures just over the last two or three mm -hmm. weeks it's it's incredible uh yes senator hornback and i might just comment i think the way that program works is they have to hit a d3 before it and then it's an automatic trigger mm -hmm. that uh, releases it for haying and grazing but it has to hit a d3 and like angela you said we've only got a couple of counties Correct. It hit a D3. Mm -hmm. So even all the other counties up my way even, I mean, there's a lot of CRP ground that could be grazed or mm -hmm. hayed mm -hmm. or something right now, but we don't hit that national trigger. You're correct, Senator. And on the D2, it has to be for eight consecutive weeks. And as I said, the grazing season for most of the grass, especially in that the grass that's used in that part of the state, that the end of the grazing season is November 15th, I believe. Do we have any additional questions? I do want to, yes. Chairman, if I could, you know, yes. when, when you all had me here last, it was about the tornado, and there has been a program announced, just the guidelines of that program have not been announced. But talking about an ad hoc program, this, is, this came up, and the administration uh, has approved $20 million to be used for tornado. So it's not just Kentucky. I think Oklahoma is another area, but it's for grain bin replacement. So it's basically for storage. And they haven't, like I said, they haven't, I know 20 million can go pretty quick too, but it's uh, it's really, in, in my opinion, meant to be for uh, the people who lost grain storage. And that could be for people who also used to truck to Mayfield grain, which was, Senator, was 10 million, 10 million bushels of grain that no longer have a place to go and with diesel fuel higher. So I know the governor, what did he, they gave a, something like a $3 million fund down there to help with some of that. But this is going to be 20 million. We just don't know the outline yet. And yes, I know people are already looking for, it's kind of should have already happened maybe, but it hasn't, we, the guidelines haven't come out yet, but uh, hopefully soon. Uh, but people who, they could even be retroactive possibly for people who got loans to build grain bins. It may, uh, it may uh, uh, give money to, I think up to 75% cost share uh, on, on building those grain facilities there if they lost if they lost their, their grain storage. But I said, again, it's only $20 million and we build grain bins, $20 million can go pretty quick, but hopefully they can come up with a way that it helps everybody a little bit and maybe uh, that, that you know, does have a big need for grain storage in that area. That's the reason one of the, this was, we asked you to be here for information so we could get out to the agriculture sure. community. I know I have individuals at home who have lost barns that did not replace those barns mm -hmm. because uh, even though they were insured, the, the, the cost to rebuild mm -hmm. was more than what the, uh, the, the, the uh, barns were cover for our own insurance so this is very informational and for all our members uh, I, I asked I asked USDA to be here because our go with this committee is oversight of this master settlement dollars which are being reinvested in agriculture in a way to 
move them away from tobacco. Mm -hmm. And we have such a large impact, and a lot of that has gone to livestock Mm -hmm. and different things there, whether it be row crop. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, we're starting to see the the effects of this dry weather at home, and I know uh, I'm seeing it coming across from West Kentucky over to Frankfurt. So I greatly appreciate you coming in. And this gives us the opportunity to take this information back home and share with those sure. that they're they're getting nervous. And uh, uh, one of the things our farmers, unlike any other business, uh, they have uh, they, economical impacts mm-hmm. that might affect one business, Agriculture deals with that, but then also weather on top of it and the weather you have no control on. So Mm -hmm. thank you all so both very much. You triggered me with something else. So you talked about the barn. So we do have uh, farm storage facility loans uh, that are available at our county offices. And there are still, I I think last month's rate was uh, September. I haven't heard October is like 2.8 something percent. I mean, these are very... Uh, good loans. I think you can go up to 12 years on those. So it could help people build uh, back buildings for for farm so, uh, storage facility loans. So Hay storage counts for that. Yeah. Well. So hay barn barns. Hay or of course a grain bin. So those are some really good loans. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll add one more thing if I may. Um, so a couple of really good informational sites when it comes to USDA programs, especially FSA. Um, so we have a website called farmers.gov. It's very easy to remember. And that is the customer facing website. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased with that site. I work with beginning farmers as well and our minority farmers. And it has a lot of really good tools. There's a loan discovery tools and there's You can find your local service center. You can find resources for beginning farmers as well as information about all of our programs. That's very uh, informative and easy to navigate. So that's an excellent website, um, both for you and your constituents. And uh, Chairman uh, Hillary, you have my personal cell and my USDA email address. Please make sure all the committee members have them. So feel free to text me or shoot me an an email. I'll be glad to You have another question, Senator Webb? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Not really a question. I I want to. I think this is very appropriate for USDA to be here, uh, and I think there's so much going on on the federal and state level, and and it's important from policy standpoint. We may not always agree, but but we certainly need to know uh, what's going on and communicate, and all that is great. I'm just sorry that I was late, but that pesky day job sometimes gets in the way. But I am glad I got here to defend uh, those of us who uh, ranch in Woodford County. I, <laughs> <laughs> got in on the tail end of that. I just want to say, I don't, it's not my district, but I, you know, I have a few cows down there, so I just thought I'd bug the chairman on that. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Thank you both so very much for being here. It's greatly appreciated. And for all our committee members, I think it would be very important to you to make sure you have Director S'mores contact information to reach it's these questions come to us on a daily basis uh, I mentioned to Dean earlier I had a customer yesterday uh, one of our larger farmers there in Christian County and we were having this very discussion and I mentioned that USDA was going to be here at the committee meeting and he was very appreciative of requesting you to be here so that we are able to find this because we spread that information to our constituents mm-hmm. home but thank yeah. you both very very much very welcome thank you for having us uh our next meeting will be november 10th at ten thirty, and i think our new co-chairman will be taking over that and uh <clears throat> senator hornback we do welcome you here uh it's under circumstances we wish we did not have to welcome you here, but we know, I know I'll have someone here, and the whole committee knows we'll have someone here who uh, truly loves agriculture here in Kentucky. If there is no other business, can I have a motion for adjournment? Second. 